Hey folks, welcome. So today we'll be doing a component again from the playbook, uh, which is a very important building block on what we do. We're going to be talking about the incident command system uh, and we're going to be doing our incident command system level 100 training tonight. So this is really an orientation course. Um, it's, uh, and what, it, what we're talking about here is basically a single standard incident management system that's used by all disciplines. Um, it's uh, it, basically, uh, it's based on the incident command system out of the United States uh, and uh, ICS curriculum that was uh, developed by the uh, Justice Institute of BC. So, <coughs> Our purpose, as you can see, to provide enough information about the incident command system to enable you to work in an incident event or an event. Um, so this is designed to acquaint you with the principles, the structure and the terminology of the ICS system. Um, this doesn't include any other kind of specialized training beyond that. Um, and users of this kind of training would include public safety agencies, government agencies, private sector and of course emergency services. Uh, and that's where we fall into here. So quickly, we'll go through some of the course objectives. Um, so our first is going to be to describe uh, B-SERMs. Um, and I believe now it's, uh, they've taken the, uh, the R out of it. So it's uh, B-SEMs, but uh, we'll talk about that. We'll define ICS, we'll talk about the types of incidents, we'll talk about the 12 ICS principles, uh, incident facilities will be uh, dealt with in this as well, and uh, some common responsibilities. So, uh, you know, as well, we're going to be learning, you know, and we want to understand the names for organizational units and, uh, and the types of facilities we might use in ICS. And uh, we're going to be talking about the titles and duties of uh, ICS command and general staff. Um, We'll also touch on a bit of an introduction on the relationship between ICS and the Emergency Operations Center or the EOC. Again, I'll be using a bit of terminology here, but I'll try to remember to, uh, uh, to, to define it the first time around. But for the rest of it, again, Incident Command System, you'll hear ICS a lot, Emergency Operations Center, you'll hear EOC uh, just out of speed. And these are common terminology that we use all the time uh, in our line of work. Uh, there is a celebration of learning and you may have received the uh, email on that already with a link uh, for a new software program that we'll be using to do that. And uh, that'll be available at the end of this session if anybody wants to go and do it right away uh, or you can do it the day after or whenever you feel you'd like to. And a uh, passing mark on that would be 70%. Okay, so let's start by talking about the uh, BC Emergency Response Management System or as it's referred to now, the BC Emergency Management System. Uh, so the BC government established BSERMs as an emergency response guideline for all ministries and crown corporations. Uh, it's based on the incident command system and you'll see similar, similarities between, uh, between the, uh, the structures that you'll find in the incident command system and in your emergency operations center. <clears throat> so what, what this uh, is, is it's a comprehensive all hazards provincial emergency operations system. Uh, so it can deal with all types of emergencies. It can be scaled up for large scale emergencies or brought right down to just a small single, whether it's a, a house on fire, whether it's a hazmat situation, whether it's an, a motor vehicle accident. And really what the level we're teaching today is, is about that site level um, in, in, um, mainly, but we will also deal, uh, talk about bigger systems when we start getting into the emergency operations center side of things. All right, so again, guide for cloud, uh, it's a guide for ministries and crown corporations. It, it'll clarify the response functions uh, uh, and who's responsible for what. Uh, and it'll ensure coordination, a coordinated response with other levels of government and industry. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're all working towards the same goals as we're responding to these emergencies. Uh, we don't want to have different players in the emergency and different people helping out, working against each other out there. So ICS is really a system that's been developed to help with that. So again, the BSERMs is a comprehensive management scheme uh, that ensures a coordinated and organized response and recovery to all emergency incidents. So it's a framework for a standardized response. Uh, it provides for our agency autonomy 
uh, while we're still while we're contributing to a, co a coordinated response, right? So you're still going to be a Silver Creek firefighter, an Anglemont firefighter, uh, you know, uh, insert your fire department here, uh, but you will fit into an ICS framework on larger scale emergencies as well. And you'll see how that all works uh, in this training. Emergencies don't recognize boundaries of area or areas of responsibility. Uh, you could have major incidents that, that cross boundaries. Uh, and I mean, COVID is a great example of, you know, uh, of a situation right now that really doesn't respect uh, borders in any way. Um, and, you know, when, at the beginning of the COVID situation, we did, you know, uh, bring in an emergency operations center to, to just start, you know, trying to get a handle on the information that was coming at us fast and furious. And uh, it really helped to make sure that we were all swimming in the same direction and, uh, and uh, again, getting all the information we could. So let's talk about some of the priorities of BSERMs. Uh, and uh, these priorities are the same for all levels of response and support, right? Doesn't matter how big or small the incident is. Um, all of these, these are the priorities that we should have whenever we go to an incident. And so number one, and this is number one whenever we do any kind of anything um, with our fire departments or uh, emergency management uh, is responder safety, right? Uh, if our safety is jeopardized, we can't respond. Uh, we can't help and use our skills and expertise to make that situation better. So we have to be looking out for our own safety. Uh, number two is to save lives and that's lives of others other than the responders. Uh, number three, we want to reduce suffering. Number four, we want to look at public health. Number five would be government infrastructure. Number six, we want to protect property and protect the environment. And then we're looking to reduce losses. All right, so these are in the order that they need to be considered as far as our priorities go. All right, so some of the components of BSERMs, uh, operation and control. So again, when we talk about operation contr and control, we're talking about organizational structure and, the ma and, and management. Um, it also has to do with augmenting communications, ensuring we have uh, appropriate communications. And uh, we wanna, and it also helps us when, we, when it comes time to, to develop our tactical response uh, using the ICS and uh, three support levels. Uh, uh, next component is qualifications, the BC, uh, basically BC government personnel standards for each functional area. So there are standards and qualifications for each level in BSERMs. Um, technology, we want to be able to facilitate deployment and encourage the use of common technology. Uh, if we're not able to have, you know, be interoperable in the technology we use, it makes it much more, much, uh, much more difficult to respond to these types of uh, events. Um, we want to have training, which is what we're doing today. Uh, and again, that's designed to help us meet the standards that we need to meet. Um, and then there are a number of publications that come out as well. And those, uh, the, and those publications are designed to help us in our roles, if it's in an emergency operations center or even on, uh, at, a, at a scene. Uh, we're talking about using common forms, reports, uh, and instructional tech, uh, terminology. Okay, so basically when we're talking about BSERMs, this develops from the bottom up, right? <clears throat> so number one, we're basically, we're looking at the site level, right? And they, at the site level, we have what's called an incident command post, right? And that's what the ICP stands for, right? Uh, that's an operational level. This is basically where we as firefighters are, right? We're at that site level. We're the ones on the boots on the ground doing the work in the field. Um, so again, that's us. Above that, we go to site support, which is the Emergency Operations Center or EOC. All right. So in the event that the, uh, that the, that the situation that we're dealing with becomes much bigger and we uh, require some additional support uh, from outside of the site, uh, we may ask to activate an emergency operations center. Your incident commander can make that call. Uh, it's as easy as giving Derek or myself a call and letting us know that you've got a big scene going on here and, and uh, maybe we need to be thinking about opening an EOC. Uh, often, we will also be, uh, you know, getting the calls that you're getting and understanding that there is a major event going on uh, and we may make the call to open an EOC to provide that support uh, and make sure that uh, our people working at site have that support they need. 
So the next level that we have is the provincial and regional. And what that's called is the PREOC, right? So that's the Provincial uh, Regional Emergency Operations Center, right? Or PREOC. Uh, and again, these are typically there to help support the multiple emergency operation centers that may open up around the province at a given time. Uh, we have pre-ox uh, operating uh, all the time when we have uh, big wildfire events in the province. We had a couple of really bad years there um, and pre-ox were going uh, non-stop. Every year, basically, every summer, we're going to have, you know, uh, pre ox going because there'll be emergency operation centers for various wildfires around pr the province. And then above that, what we have is the prov uh, Provincial Central uh, or the Provincial Emergency Coordination Center, the PEC. And again, they provide support to the different pre-ocs that are around. So at site level, uh, basically, this is where we know that, you know, uh, our resources are applied, any resources that we have are going to be used. Um, you might have responders from all areas. Uh, you're going to have an on-site command, so somebody there on-site who is in command at the site level, and you will have a single command post at the site level as well. In a majority of the cases, the incidents are small. An incident command system, uh, you know, might not even need to be, uh, it might not need to be activated to a very high level, but we will always have an incident commander at every one of our calls, right? Uh, and our policy, you know, and our policies typically can dictate, you know, when it is time to start bringing it up. Uh, but it also comes down to, you know, we'll talk about some of the other factors that come into play with our decision making on whether we need to expand our, uh, uh, the ICS uh, system that we have in place. So site support, again, that was that next level uh, we talked about. So an emergency operations center uh, is established for responder support. Uh, it'll be set up by local resources. So in our case, the CSRD uh, will operate the Emergency Operations Centre in the Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District, typically. Uh, we do have a couple of other smaller um, emergency management programs out there, one in Revelstoke, one in Golden, uh, that do have the ability to operate their own EOC as well, but often we'll be supporting even, uh, those, uh, those EOCs as well. Uh, our EOC would be set up in Salmon Arm and uh, typically out of the CSRD office. Um, again, that's the pre-designated site, and we will follow the ICS principles in that EOC. Uh, and again, we're going to operate, we're going to activate this when on-site responders feel they need a little bit of additional support, some resources, maybe some other agencies to show up, right? So we're talking about larger incident or multi-agency, multi-jurisdiction type calls. Uh, they provide, so the EOC will provide support for uh, policy, coordination, resources. We may have, a, you know, a policy group in there, technical specialists may be brought in to help us out. Uh, and uh, again, there's all sorts of different functions that will be played out at the emergency operations center level that we'll talk about. So with provincial regional, coordin uh, regional coordination, uh, we're talking about a pre-oc and the, our closest one would be in Kamloops actually. And what they do is they provide support for local emergencies. Um, they'll define operational area when, if, uh, when necessary. They'll help to integrate any provincial support uh, that's required for the, uh, the event. And they're gonna be staffed by regional personnel. Um, so, Again, it's a multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency uh, type situation we're dealing with here. Um, the resource, this, is, this will be activated when the resource requirements exceed our local capabilities uh, and more than one incident area will be involved. Again, the wildland, uh, wild, wildfires that, uh, seasons that we've had is a great example of when uh, you're gonna have a pre-oc open up. Uh, and again, these are gonna, these are gonna help us, manage, they're gonna help to manage the provincial involvement and assistance to the local areas. And then there's the provincial central coordination that we talked about, and that's to, that, that's to coordinate provincial resources, uh, prioritize provincial objectives, and, and, and coordinate with any federal support that may be needed. Again, now we're getting into the much bigger systems. Um, so it'll be something, you know, the, 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 the provincial central coordination is on, is on a province-wide basis, and uh, it coordinates with all that federal assistance as well beyond uh, the ability of what the EOC or the PREOC can do. Okay, now that we've gotten into all that, let's, talk, let's start talking about the Incident Command System, or ICS. So again, ICS is a model for command, control, and coordination of an emergency response at the site, at the site level. Uh, 
so it's a standardized management system of coordinating the efforts of, of individual agencies. Get us all swimming in that same direction. It's, uh, it's functional, it's modular, and, uh, and it's flexible. It can expand, it can contract, uh, and, uh, and, and it can be used in uh, so many different uh, ways. Uh, and, and it can look very different depending on the, uh, the events we're talking about here. And its entire goal is to improve efficiency and effectiveness of our response. So when we talk about the application of the incident uh, command system, uh, it, can, it can go out anywhere. Uh, we use it for fires, for natural disasters, uh, multi-casualty, multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency, any kind of planned events that we may have, which might be, you know, what we're doing some, pre some kind of burning, uh, you know, uh, burn backs or, uh, to, to create areas uh, that uh, will resist wildfire, um, you know, pest eradication, search and rescue, oil spill response, hazmat, really the list goes on, right? It's, it's applicable to both emergency and non-emergency situations, as you can see from the list we have here. Uh, and we, it's known as an all risk system that uses a common organizational structure and key management principles in a standardized way. So let's start talking about the, uh, the 12 principles of ICS now. So again, we have 12 principles. Number one, uh, basically, is uh, that we'll talk about is the five uh, primary management functions uh, within ICS. Uh, the next principle is we'll talk about is establishing and the transfer of command. Talk about single or unified command. We'll talk about management by objectives, consolidated action plans, resource management, We'll talk about the terms unity and chain of command. And again, these are going to be, you'll find these all on page 15 of the handout that I sent out with this. Uh, we'll talk about what a manageable span of control is, how many people we can manage under us. We'll talk about how ICS is a modular organization. Personnel accountability, which we should all be fairly familiar with at our fire scenes. Uh, common terminology, which again, I touched on quickly at the beginning, make sure we're all uh, speaking uh, the same language. And, uh, and integrated communication. So again, these are the fundamental ICS building blocks, all right? Page 15 in your student handout. So let's uh, start with number one. Um, so are the five primary ICS management functions, all right? And we can see them on the screen here. We've got our command in the center, and then we've got the four, uh, the, the four levels, the operations, logistics, planning, and finance administration, all right? So basically at any incident, there's always going to be an incident commander. That is 100% every time. We always need to have somebody that is in charge of that and managing, uh, and managing the, uh, the scene. The incident commander has the ultimate responsibility for the effective and safe ex execution of the other five functions. Um, the incident commander may end up being responsible for all. At a small incident, few resources, we are not going to necessarily be putting out an operations, uh, a person in operations, logistics, planning, finance. Um, each element can be established separately as we need it. And the incident commander can delegate authority for manning certain functions. If they don't delegate it, that function falls on the incident commander. <laughs> so again, remember, like in small incident where ICS position may, uh, the, the incident commander may end up managing all five positions. All right. So you can see here the way that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the five primary ICS management functions are set up. All, each section is going to report directly to command. All right. They don't have people in between them. So the operations is going to go directly to command, planning section, logistics and finance, all of them go directly to command. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the functional responsibilities of each of these. All right, so <clears throat> basically with command, they have overall responsibility of the scene and they sent the incident priorities and the objectives that we need to, that, that we're looking to meet. Operations, again, that's kind of where we fall into a lot of times if we're looking at larger scale incident, uh, incidents is we're gonna be in the operations section. And again, the operations section is there to carry out the plan, develop those tactical objectives and, and, uh, and really get the job done. They're the ones doing the work out there uh, at the emergency scene. 
So the planning section is uh, basically about planning and evaluation. So they'll prepare the action plan uh, and they'll, may, uh, they'll maintain resource and situation status. How are our resources doing? What's the situation? They'll look at weather reports down the road. What are we, you know, if, if in wildland situations, they're the ones looking up, what are we looking at for the next operational window? Uh, you know, are we going to get a wind shift? Are we going to get, you know, a major rainstorm come through? Uh, all that comes through the planning. And really the big one is that uh, help to prepare that action plan, right? The logistics, again, they're support for the responders and the incident needs. Uh, they'll help, uh, they're the getters. They're the ones who are gonna get everything that we're gonna need. And finance and administration, again, they're the costs, uh, cost accounting and procurements. Uh, emergencies cost money. Bills need to be paid, contracts need to be signed. And a lot of times it's gonna be the finance and administration that makes sure that all that is being taken care of, that we're getting, you know, that, that the people working are going to, you know, get, get paid in, in a lot of cases, that the contractors coming in and the equipment that we need is being paid for and any necessary contracts are being entered into. All right, so again, command. The command function is directed by the incident commander. Pretty straightforward, yeah? Talk about the functional responsibilities of the incident commander. And they have a lot of responsibilities as anyone who's been in command knows. And those responsibilities increase if they don't delegate the other sections to, uh, to another person. So again, we'll, we'll start going, I'll, I'll just list them first and we'll talk about them uh, a little bit. But we've got uh, command, safety, liaison, information, operations, planning, logistics, finance, it's all, these are all things that the, the incident commander is going to have to, well, obviously juggle, right? Unless these responsibilities are gonna be, are delegated, uh, they are performed by the incident commander. Normally the first arriving person, uh, first arriving officer uh, to, uh, to our fire scenes, we say is going to be that incident commander unless they, uh, until such time as they are formally relieved of that job. Uh, and it, maybe they're going to transfer command, maybe the incident uh, is, is completed and they can go home. But we want to see that first responding officer taking that incident command role. Um, uh, for a minor single unit response, we might not need the the activation of a full ICS system, obviously, for that. Um, and, you know, the, the event's going to dictate what what we need. Um, and uh, the local position designations will apply until incident, the incident command system is activated. So, again, um, yeah, we're, we'll just call her, you, you'll call yourself, you know, whether it's White Lake Command or, and, and, uh, and you'll work to get the, the, get the emergency under control. Uh, and the incident commander may end up holding all of these unless delegated. So let's talk, okay, here's a few of those responsibilities. Uh, from command, establish the incident command post. So we want to know where uh, that incident commander is. It's very important to have an incident command post identified, and that's the place the incident commander should say. It's not for the incident commander to start wandering around everywhere all the time and just here and there and not be able to be found. That's not, you know, we do need to do our size ups, but we need to also have a place where we can be to have kind of a, that, that thousand mile view of, of what's going on from above. We're not the ones that need to be in there with the tunnel vision looking at a specific task. We need to look at the big picture as an incident commander. Uh, we want to protect life and property. We're going to be setting the objectives that we're trying to meet. We need to manage our resources. Do we have enough personnel? Do we have enough, uh, you know, apparatus and water and what else, you know, what are we going to need to, to manage this? Do we have those resources? Um, they may end up being a liaison uh, between, you know, uh, between different functions. Um, they'll, they have overall responsibility for the emergency scene and uh, they're going to be thinking very highly, very strongly about risk management and mitigating those risks that the responders are facing and that may be getting, that may be faced by the public as well. And so again, incident commander, just to say, again, um, they have the total responsibility for managing the, inc for managing the incident. Uh, they do. They have. They they develop the incident action plan. They'll find the resources and manage those tactical resources. And uh, basically, either a single or a unified command will direct the overall response activities. All right. So let's talk a little bit about those. So again, we've got the incident commander here. Um, the incident commander. They they need to be qualified to command at the level. Uh, at, at the level that they're put into or at the type of incident they're at, right? You can't be an incident commander if you're not qualified to be an incident commander for that. You don't have the proper training to do it. And this is part of that training is this course here. Uh, you should not be in that role. And that's pretty straightforward for anything we do. Um, the skills training is the agency's responsibility and that's, and we're the agency that, uh, that helps provide that training. 
So you all, the incident commander can also have a deputy and that deputy also must be fully qualified to be the incident commander, all right? They're not just somebody there to, you know, like to help bring coffee. This is somebody who's fully qualified, the same qualifications uh, as the incident commander has. Uh, you may, there may be more than one uh, deputy as well, and uh, they may represent different agencies or jurisdictions, uh, and they may at, at times be required to assume the incident command position and, and provide relief. So again, if, if you're asked ever about, you know, what's the support position for the incident commander, it's the deputy, right? And uh, again, we talked about that, the incident commander may use one or more deputies from the same agency or other jurisdictions. All right, so uh, when we, here's where we're, we'll start talking about from the incident commander. They, they may also have a, what's called a command staff. And the command staff includes a, an information officer, a safety officer, and a liaison officer. Um, so again, these functions are going to be the responsibility of the incident commander unless delegated. And uh, what we call these are the command staff. All right, remember that this is the command staff uh, and uh, when they're delegated to someone else, so if we put somebody in the position, uh, the person is called an officer. So again, like I said, the information officer, the safety officer, the liaison officer are all part of this command staff. So the information officer, uh, we're going to have one per incident at most, right? Uh, again, this is something that may or may not end up happening. And if we don't delegate it, the incident commander is it. Um, the information officer may end up having assistance. Uh, and what they are is a central point of, uh, for information uh, dissemination, right? So info for news media and other organizations is going to come from them. They'll do all the all press releases, uh, but those press releases do need to be approved by the incident commander before going out as well. All right, for a safety officer, uh, again, one per incident, right? Uh, so their primary function is personnel safety. They're trying to anticipate, detect, and correct unsafe situations. Uh, and the safety officer does have the emergency authority to stop unsafe acts immediately, right? Safety officer may also have assistance. I know I've done situation, we had a, when we did a large scale exercise a, a while back in Sycamus, um, we were, you know, we had a multi-jurisdiction, we were, we were doing an exercise for a multi-jurisdictional response. And, uh, you know, uh, even in that, uh, doing that, we used the ICS system to ensure that we had people outside of the role playing that was happening and the, uh, the emergency exercise that was happening to actually ensure that, you know, everyone was acting safe. I was put in a safety, in the safety officer position uh, for that. And I had a number of assistants because the size and scope was far too much for me to keep my eyes on. I needed others to be able to uh, pay attention to the other jurisdictions and agencies that were working there and make sure that everything was taken care of safely. All right, the liaison officer. So they're a contact point for representatives of, uh, for, of assisting and cooperating agencies, right? So um, basically any agency representatives, they're gonna come in, they're gonna report to the liaison officer. Um, so the assisting agency will provide the tactical or service resources. And uh, cooperating agency is one that provides uh, support other than tactical services, uh, service resources. For example, things like the, the Red Cross, employment office, etc. cetera. Um, and the liaison office, officer may have assistance as well, just like the safety officer. Um, and like the safety officer, all the assistants should have an appropriate level of, of their of technical capability and, their, and qualifications. Uh, and the role of the assistant is to support the primary position. All right, so we've talked about the command staff. Now we're gonna start talking a bit about the general staff, okay? So the general staff includes those five, the, the other four of those five functions that we talked about uh, from ICS. And that's the operations chief, the operations section, and they have a chief. The planning section has a chief. Logistics section, they would be a chief, and finance and administration also a chief. And each one of these chiefs may have one or more deputies, right? So again, anyone in that general staff there, you know, we had, uh, we had the liaison, safety officer, information officer, the, these, uh, these functions are known as chief. <laughs> With planning, uh, basically uh, in smaller incidents, the incident commander is normally going to be responsible for planning. Um, but uh, 
you know, we can, uh, we need to look ahead, anticipate the problems and or what events are going to be happening, and we need to plan accordingly, right? So with resources, we need, uh, we basically they're maintaining resource status. Um, they want to, for check-ins, they're going to have to make sure that's happening. Uh, personnel and equipment status is maintained. Um, basically uh, the situation unit, uh, they will collect process and display any information and maps, etc. Uh, the documentation unit, they're going to help produce uh, the incident action plan. Uh, they're going to help maintain all documentation. And um, basically for the demobilization, they're looking at in large incidents, we need to know how to, uh, how to scale down once the incident is under control. Uh, they help assist in that termination of resources that are no longer required. Send them home if we don't need them. Everything's going to cost money and we want to try and save it for uh, save the taxpayers money where we can here. <clears throat> so at the operations section, again, the incident commander is going to determine whether there's going to be a, a need to activate a separate operations section. Um, and they're going to carry out the response uh, activities that are going to be included in the incident action plan. Uh, you'll only have one chief per operational period, and the chief is normally from the jurisdiction or agency having the greatest authority or involve, uh, involvement. So some of the duties of that uh, operations section chief, again, they're directing all tactical operations, um, any organizational setup, uh, they'll figure out what resources they require, they'll assist incident command, uh, they'll provide operational status reports as to how we're doing. And again, one per operational period. You'll never, you don't have more than one chief at a time, but you may have deputies that can step in if needed. So again, the operations section directs and coordinates all tactical operations. Uh, they organize, they or, the organization will develop as required. So, you know, what do we need? Uh, you, uh, you know, do we need necessarily, you know, to have an air unit? Do we need to have, uh, you know, uh, a different a task force or a strike team to go do something? Uh, they're the ones who are going to, basically the incident is going to help determine what we need, right? Um, the organization uh, can consist of, you know, single resources, which we are a single resource. You as a firefighter is, are a single resource and uh, one truck uh, piece of apparatus would be a single resource. Um, there's also task force and strike teams and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, they think they uh, might uh, have to do with staging areas, air operations, and, uh, and they may also break down into divisions, groups, and branches and we'll discuss that briefly as well. So we just so with the logistics section, we're looking at, uh, again, they provide service and support to the incident or the event. They're, so they're the getters. We need something. This is the, these are the folks that are going to get it for us, right? Um, they're geared to support the incident uh, responders. Um, their six principal activities are on the left there and two branch structure can happen if needed. So again, they, they just support the personnel and, and resources uh, directly assigned to the incident. Um, responsible for all of the service and support needs and uh, it's going to be whether we have this section or not is going to be based on the need. So again we talked it could be broken into branches so here we have so if we were breaking it into branches we might break it up this way and have what's called the service branch which would include communications, medical and food and these are the services that we need for a successful uh, uh, large-scale event. So communications, uh, develop a communications plan, make sure we have the right equipment. Um, with medical, we're looking at uh, the treatment of injured personnel, uh, making sure reports are filed, medical transportation for responders if necessary. Um, we don't, and, and typically that medical branch is not going to be the ones responsible for victims. We're talking about responders in this case. Uh, and food, again, we need to eat. And uh, when an emergency scene takes a, a long period of time, we're going to need to find a way to get resources and food to those, uh, to the personnel working out there. So the next branch we'll talk about is the support branch. And the support branch includes supply, uh, facilities, and ground support. So with supply, we're looking at all resource orders are, are placed basically through that supply, uh, it's, it's supply branch. Um, with facilities, uh, they're going to set up and maintain any necessary facilities that we that we need. Um, maybe base camp is required. They can uh, also oversee base camp managers, provide security there. 
Uh, and then with the ground support, uh, we're looking at things like transportation, fuel, maintenance of assigned vehicles. So maybe we have what, what, like an equipment manager, somebody who's actually going to be overseeing all of that, right? So again, these units are also activated as required and as the situation dictates. And they're all under the logistics section. All right, so the finance section. Uh, these could be set up for any incident that may require on-site financial management. Um, and mostly we're looking at larger incidents where we, where we start talking about that. Um, and again, if it's not, if it's not given to a different, uh, if it's not uh, assigned to someone, it's the incident commander who will be doing the finance section. And these are, again, I, I can speaking as an incident commander at a number of scenes, I can tell you, these are things that do go through our head is, is, you know, I need to bring in a, a backhoe to take down a structure. Um, I need to make sure I'm recording it properly so that when we go back to get the money back from the insurance company, we're able to do that. So it does happen even on smaller type scenes, which again, I'm talking about a single house structure fire being one of those smaller type scenes, uh, we do still need to be considering uh, the finance side of things. But in the bigger scenes, we might end up actually appointing one, in which case you may have these different types of units established, the time unit for, uh, you know, again, they're just recording uh, personnel time. Um, the procurement unit, again, they're helping to, to with uh, getting equipment and uh, rental supply contracts. So they'll help with the contract side of things that logistics will be really setting up. Uh, compensation and claims, workers' compensation, records, claims, things like that. Uh, cost unit, uh, and they're going to collect cost information and, co and try to provide cost estimates for anything that's, uh, that's proposed. So, uh, again, on-site financial management, this is going to be important for insurance or government claims for funds, right? Uh, smaller incidents to handle the procurement of equipment, contracting vendors, and preparing cost estimates, we might also need this. So the financial, basically what we're looking at here is we want to mo we monitor incident costs, uh, keep our financial records, uh, administer those contracts, and record the time. So now let's look at how that system all comes together into one larger system. This is a fully expanded ICS organization. Something like this, you wouldn't see something like this unless we're dealing with a very large incident, right? Where we need to have all of these functions activated. Uh, and again, like I mentioned before, this, this, this system is meant to expand and contract as we need it to, uh, and it depend, depending on the response needs. So we're going to cover all the major elements individually as well. And uh, page 23 is a good place in your student guide to get that. All right, so our, going back to our ICS principles, number two, the establishing and transferring of command. So establishing command. Command is initially established by the highest ranking authority on scene that has jurisdiction over the incident, right? So again, for us, that means that officer, that first arriving officer and that first arriving apparatus, they're the ones who we ask uh, that we expect would be, would, be taking the, uh, would be taking command of that scene, right? So some of the functions that they will perform, they will assume command. Right? So again, they're going to announce, they're going to size up, uh, perform a size up, uh, they're going to de determine their priorities, uh, objectives, strategies, tactics, ensure the safety of the responders and make sure we have all the resources. So maintain command, uh, basically that's a con it takes constant evaluation and judgment and, and adjustment, sorry, to, uh, you know, as we're going on, uh, because the scene changes, what's going on changes, our tactical objectives may, may change and we need to change with it. And, uh, and then we're looking at reassign command to a third party. If in the case uh, you're that first responding officer in that apparatus and you get out and you're, uh, you, let's say you're a captain in your fire department and your chief arrives on scene, there's a possibility you would be looking to transfer command to that person. Now, again, I show up at major fire scenes and, you know, I do not necessarily want to take command from, a, from an incident commander. All of our fire chiefs and incident commanders, captains, you're all very well trained in how to do the job. And you're not, and, and the best way to get that experience is to do the job. So, so unless something's going very wrong, I'm, I, I myself don't take command. But uh, somebody, a superior officer coming on scene, does have the uh, the right to to assume command and and ask for you to transfer command as well. And you can always ask if it's if you don't feel comfortable in the role. So let's talk about some of the reasons we may want to look at a transfer of command, right? 
a more qualified person is coming to and, and uh, to, to assume command. We do want to have the most qualified people there. Um, but uh, but again, I, I tend to hesitate to take command uh, unless there's unless I see a real need. The person's struggling in the position, and that doesn't happen very often. So, um, but uh, a more qualified person can come in and and and, and assume command. Uh, a jurisdictional or agency in a jurisdiction or agency in charge and command is legally required or makes good management sense. Uh, so maybe we show up, we find out, oh, geez, this is a hostage taking situation. Maybe we want to transfer command to the RCMP because it's a jurisdictional issue that we are not comfortable with, right? It becomes a major medical emergency, same idea. We may want to transfer that to a BC ambulance, BC health, emergency health services, right? Another reason for transferring command is no is just normal turnover of personnel or uh, on long or extended incidents. If you've been working for eight hours straight, you've been an incident commander on a major scene for a long time, you need sleep, right? We don't function well. We need to have our rest and relaxation, rehabilitation, the same as the uh, the same as the, the doers out there and the ones who are doing the work. So we want to make sure that we uh, that we that we account for that as well. So again, this. Based on the complexity of the incident, the qualifications and the experience uh, of the incident commander, um, when we're demobilizing, the transfer could be to a less senior person, right? If we're if the emergency is has come to an end, maybe the incident commander is like, oh, all right, I'm done. You can transfer down, and it could be maybe you're going to transfer command at that point to a captain. That is that is something that can happen as well. Um, anytime a transfer takes place, the outgoing incident commander is going to give a full briefing to the incoming incident commander, and there will be a notification broadcast to all staff, typically over the radio. You'll make the broadcast all staff, you know, um, and let them know that command is being transferred from yourself to whoever the new commander is. Okay, so our third principle we'll talk about here is a unified command structure. So what a unified command does is it allows agencies with geographic or functional jurisdiction to develop a common set of incident objectives and strategies. So again, we're looking at something where maybe we have a larger cross-border incident uh, or something that crosses jurisdictions and operational capacities. Uh, things like wildfires, earthquakes, uh, you know, major storms, uh, hazardous materials call. Um, basically, when we're looking at a unified command, a, uh, basically they're going to have the same authority as a single incident commander, okay? So there may be more than one uh, person, but there's only one seat, and both of you are filling the same hat in that situation, all right? So with the unified command, again, we, we still want to determine together the, the overall objectives. Uh, we'll do joint planning for operational activities so that we're working together. Uh, perhaps it's a situation that involves a police response with a fire response. We want to make sure that we're all operating on the same page, so we're going to develop that together. Um, we want to make sure that we're using our resources the best way we possibly can, right? And this helps us to maximize those resources. And uh, there is no loss of agency or jurisdictional authority when we go with this system and provide for a unified command. So under a unified command, the following always applies, all right? So here's a few things that, uh, that, that uh, we need to keep in mind, which is we're only going to have one incident action plan, right? Two people, one incident action plan, all right? Uh, we don't, it, each is not going to come up with a separate one because that's when we start battling and, 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 and maybe we're working at counter uh, against each other, basically, and uh, counteracting what the, other, the work the other is trying to do. There still be one operation section chief, so whoever is doing the operations is still going to. There's still going to be one operation section chief, even if it's a fire and a police call. You're going. You're still only going to have the one ops chief. Still one command post. Still one spokesperson. Um, and either that single or unified command will direct will direct the overall response activities at the site. So uh, let's take this as a little bit of an example here. There's a jurisdictional incident. We have a hazardous materials incident that's crossed three jurisdictions, right? So in this situation here, each jurisdiction or agency with responsibility of the incident will have a representative in that unified command. In this case, we will have three in that uh, unified command chair. So three individuals in one chair, one, uh, we're coming up with one incident action plan uh, and uh, one operations section chief, right? Now we'll talk about the fourth principle, which is management by objectives. 
All right, so we're gonna build this up from the bottom. The, the, these are, I'm gonna go through four steps uh, that take place at every incident, all right? So the first one we have here is understand agency policy and direction, right? We wanna understand, are there any environmental restrictions that we have, limits of authority? What are the SOGs in this situation? So we wanna understand what's going on. So we wanna establish the incident objectives, all right? So this is basically a statement of intent. What do we want to do? Uh, and again, we have to keep in mind time may be a factor. What can we get done and what do we want to get done may end up being two different things, but we're going to set that, uh, that statement of intent on what we want to do here. So once we've uh, decided what we want to do, we're going to determine an appropriate strategy to say and select that uh, appropriate strategy. What method are we going to use to achieve the desired results, right? What to, to achieve our objectives. And then what we have here is we perform our tactical direction. So we, we establish the tactics that are going to be used. We assign the appropriate resources to it. We monitor the performance and we monitor uh, scene safety. And what that's going to result in is, yay, we've achieved our goal. All right. So that's a, all of these work together to help us achieve whatever our priorities are and achieve that final end goal. All right, so our fifth principle we'll talk about here is uh, consolidated incident action plans, all right? So one thing to keep in mind, there should be an action plan for every response. We need to have a, an action plan for every response. Whether it's written or oral, it, it, we have to have that plan. Larger events, when we're talking about structure fires and higher, we need to have a written incident action plan. For smaller, maybe we're doing traffic control, uh, not necessarily have to have an incident action plan in there, but you have it in your head. The incident commander knows I'm going to have, you know, my, my buffer zones uh, put up over here. I'm gonna have my uh, parked on a fend off. They're each on a certain tactical channel you know what is going on and you're able to keep that you know on a smaller scene in your head but you need to have that action plan and what the action plan helps do is it, it provides direction right it uh, it provide it's got measurable tactical operations uh, and it's going to apply for a certain operational period right so what this action plan really does is it outlines how the incident should be managed right so when we talk about operational periods Right? Um, operational periods could change uh, and really there is no fixed length on what an operational period is. It's what makes sense for the incident. All right. Uh, again, it's going to be affected by the, t the, the time to accomplish tactical objectives. Right? But we want to make sure that it's not going to be longer than 24 hours. That is one thing about, no, there is one fixed length and that is it doesn't go over 24 hours. Uh, 12 hours or less are common and often that's because of, again, we need rest and recovery. Uh, having someone, you know, uh, work for 12 hours straight uh, might be a little bit much. Eight is also a very common amount of time for an operational period. And again, that's all going to be determined at the, uh, by the incident commander and uh, whoever's in charge there. Um, so again, uh, what else do we have here based on incident needs, right? So how long that is going to be is going to be based on incident needs. Can we get this done in eight hours? Do we think we might need 12? Maybe we're going to need to go a bit longer. Um, we're going to want to plan in advance to ensure that we have the resources, right? So again, the, uh, the length of that operational period, um, you know, can be affected by other things like safety considerations, weather, time of day, uh, you know, how easy is it for us to, 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 to get other resources in as well. Something to remember about written action plans, we need to have a written action plan uh, for uh, any emergency where there are two or more jurisdictions involved. Guaranteed, 100%, we need to have a written action plan. Also, when the incident will over overlap an operational period change. So if we're looking at a long duration uh, uh, event, something that we aren't going to take care of in you know, four hours or, or, you know, even maybe eight hours, we're definitely going to start to need to look at, uh, at having that in written incident action plan. Uh, when we have a partial or full activation of the ICS organization, we're going to need to have that incident action plan. So again, when we when our incident starts getting big, we need to have that written plan. And what that written plan does is uh, now everybody can have access to it and be, again, working towards the same goal. So the decision to have a written plan is going to be made by the, by the incident commander or it might be outlined in agency policy. So again, we've, uh, with large incidents in, oh, I think I've got a couple in the waiting room here. Um, 
<laughs> so when larger incidents involve uh, an ICS activation, we need to have that incident action plan. And what that what that's also going what that helps is we're going to ensure our continuity uh, when there's an operational period change, right? So uh, the operational period has changed. Maybe there's a change of personnel, uh, but we can continue. The, the continuity is still there. If we have that written plan, we can give it to the new incident commander uh, for the new operational period. All right, so our action plan um, may consist of various forms detailing each step of the plan, right? Uh, so I've got a couple of the different types of forms you might find, uh, the ICS-202, ICS-203, 204. Uh, these are all numbered forms that we have within the ICS system uh, that help us deal with the incident objectives, uh, organizational assignments, uh, and assignment lists, right? So. Again, with our action plan, we want to have a statement of our objectives. What are we trying to achieve? What is it we're trying to achieve? And, and it must be measurable and appropriate to the, to, to the emergency that we're at. The action plan also is going to have a sense, uh, basically have our organization. What elements of ICS are going to be in place? Are we going to have an operations chief? Are we going to have a finance and administration chief? Uh, are we going to have the liaison officer, the safety officer, um, the information officer? So we need to have that in this action plan. Our assignments uh, to accomplish the object objectives. So again, what tactics are we gonna be using? Uh, what resources have been assigned uh, to accomplish these objectives? Uh, we're also gonna include in this action plan any supporting materials, things like maps, traffic plans, communications plans, whatever we feel is gonna be necessary to ensure that, we, that, uh, that uh, anyone reading this understands the plan and knows where we're going, right? So these are, uh, these are important. Again, this is uh, page 26 in your book. And uh, you know, these are the four main elements of the incident action plan. So we talked a little bit about those forms, right? Um, just I'll go through, uh, these are some, these are uh, the forms I'll go through now. We've got uh, with the planning side of things here, but uh, they, well, again, incident objectives. Um, we'll just go through these quick. ICS 203 is about an organization assignment list. 204 is the assignment list. 205 is a radio communications plan. 206, we've got a medical plan. So these are all forms, once you get into higher levels, so we're, this is a 100 level course. So we don't get into too deep into the weeds on these types of forms in this course. But as you progress through, you might start seeing these forms come up more. ICS 200, 300, and if you go on. Um, so basically all supervisory personnel need to be familiar with the incident action plan and uh, there'll be briefings to help us sh the, to make sure that these types of forms are distributed and everybody is on the same page. All right, ICS principles number six, a comprehensive resource management. I'm just gonna take a drink here, sorry. All right, so. Assign, uh, basically uh, assign resources are managed in three different ways. And these three different ways are a single resource, task, force, task, task forces, and strike teams. So when we talk about a single resource, again, we've talked about that, uh, I touched on it earlier. It includes personnel or equipment. It is a single helicopter, a single firefighter, a single fire apparatus. All right, that is a single resource. All right, now we get into a little bit more uh, of uh, the meat of it here. So we talk about the task force, right? A task force is a combination of single resources for a particular tactical need. All right, they're gonna have a leader and common communication. So you'll have, you know, a team leader. Um, and the size and type of resources are based on tactical needs. Again, we wanna look at our span of control. So we've got, basic, we've got multiple different types of resources, all they're trying to accomplish a single task. Um, and uh, this task force may end up, it may be predetermined or assembled at an incident, you know, using what is available there. All right, so, when we, so we're looking with a task force at uh, a combination of different types of single resources, all right, for a particular tactical need. So different resources. Police is one type of resource, uh, fire, uh, bulldozer, we need them all together. We can put a task force together. You are now um, going out to protect that structure that may be impinged by wildfire. That's all right, so you're, you're, you're a task force for that. Now, strike team is a combination of the same kind and type, right? So in here, the strike team, we have um, 
Sorry, I just got a message up. Is, uh, is this still coming in okay? Everyone hearing me still? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. It's a bit so, choppy sometimes. All right. I think my, my internet's uh, acting up a little bit. Just uh, cut me off if, if something's happening uh, and I'll, uh, I'll hold up and try and fix it. Okay. So again, the strike team is a combination of the same type of resource. Uh, they'll also have a leader in a common communications. Um, and again, this is all based on span of control. As we get, you know, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger, we want to make sure we can only manage so many people at an emergency scene. Uh, so we want to make sure we're breaking it down into, into these types of groups. So strike teams can be predetermined or assembled at an incident, right? So by using task force and strike teams, basically we're gonna maximize the effectiveness of the resources that we have. Uh, we're gonna reduce the span of control. So that's how many people uh, we have to oversee at a given time. And it's going to help reduce the communications traffic because now you don't have a bunch of single resources trying to talk to each other. You've now got uh, one single team leader in that, strike, in that strike team or task force that, that the incident commander needs to talk to, not seven different people, right? So, sorry, where are we at here? Um, so, resource status conditions. There's uh, three types that, I'm, that we'll talk about here. The first is assigned, right? That's somebody who's performing active duties right now. That, their, that resource is assigned. Uh, they may be termed av deemed available. That means they're not assigned yet. They, they're awaiting, maybe in staging, ready for assignment at that time. And out of service, uh, these are, th this is resources that are uh, not assigned and not available for whatever reason. Maybe the, it's an apparatus that, uh, that uh, blew a tire, um, has an issue, a mechanical issue of some sort. Maybe it's a firefighter who's, uh, uh, who's injured or needs to go and, uh, and, uh, and rest. So the seventh principle of incident command system is uh, unity and chain of command. All right, so these, these are very key concepts in ICS. So unity of command, what we're talking about with that is we have a clear line of supervision. Each person reports to only one individual. This is very important, okay? You have one superior, one, one supervisor and one supervisor only that you report to, all right? If you're put on a team and the incident commander says, okay, you're gonna be my attack team, the team leader is the only one who should be now communicating with command. The rest of the team communicates with the team leader who will then pass it up the line, right? So each piece of person at the scene needs to know who their superior, who their supervisor is and how the line of authority works at that scene, right? Uh, this provides for safety, accountability, it's efficient. Uh, in most cases, uh, the line is from command to a single resource. Again, that's in, in the smaller scenes. Um, but a proper chain of command is needed to be followed as the scene expands, right? So that now when we talk about chain of command, uh, basically a chain of command is an orderly ranking of management positions in the line of authority, right? So when, when we're talking about chain of command, the operations chief re re reports to the uh, inc incident commander. Uh, the, you know, the branch director for an area would report to the operations chief who reports up to the incident commander. So that's what the chain of command is talking about. With unity of command, it's the concept that you have one and only one supervisor at that scene. And this comes down to our eighth principle, where we talk about manage, uh, manageable span of control, right? Um, so a span of control, when we talk about that, it's the number of resources or organizational elements that one supervisor can manage effectively, right? Um, basically, the, this, the research has been done that shows that, hum that we humans are able to effectively maintain our uh, control, uh, command and control of between three at the lowest, you know, three to seven at the most, right? Uh, basically five is really in that nice sweet spot right there. But yeah, between three and seven is a manageable span of control. Um, there may be some exceptions where you might have unit crews and other specially trained crews that do it, uh, you know, that do it a little differently, but typically just keep that in mind, the three to seven. All right, so again, one, per, one to three or one to seven. 
Any ratios outside of this range could require the expansion or the consolidation of the, uh, of the organization. So that's where we start bringing in our ICS principles to keep that span of control appropriate for what we're doing. All right. So here we have one incident commander. You can see, uh, you know, let's say one supervisor. And how many are they overseeing here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine people, right? This is not effective, right? This is ineffective and potentially dangerous now. Uh, you know, with once, uh, you know, the human brain is only able to keep so much, you know, together at one point in time. Having the, having, and, uh, having nine, that's too many. We're beyond that seven, which we talked about as being our maximum, right? So what we want to do is break that out and make sure that we have, and, and break it down into a more effective span of control, all right? So you'll have the one incident commander. They may have, uh, you know, again, the way they've broken it down here, um, there are other ways of doing it. Maybe I would have given two to each one of the three underneath the incident commander, right? Or, but again, we want to look at keeping those three together. So um, basically in each one of these situations, there is one supervisor for each of these groups and that one supervisor is the one who will communicate up the line. So the incident commander has gone from a span of control of nine to now having a span of control of three that they are directly overseeing. The person below them, right, basically, if you can see my pointer, this person here has a span of control of three, right? This person has nobody to, the, that they need to pay attention to. And the, this person, again, is a team leader for another team of three. And that is an effective span of control. Hey, Sean, you're being pretty choppy. Okay. Is it, with, uh, is it better yet? Yeah, it's good now. Okay. So again, that optimum span of control, like I touched on in the last slide, that optimum span of control is one to five. You have one supervisor, you have five people under them, right? All right, so now we'll talk about it as a, a, the module organization, principle number nine of ICS. All right, so the ICS system has the ability to expand or contract. We talked about that, right? Depending on the scope and scale of the incident, we can make it bigger, we can make it smaller as we need. And an important thing to, 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 to understand about ICS is a, the system is that form follows function, right? Um, basically, what we need to get accomplished, that's going to dictate what, the, what form this, uh, this organization is going to take. All right, so the organization should only reflect what is required to meet our plan tactical objectives. We don't fill a role that doesn't need to be filled. If I don't have aircraft, I'm not gonna have an aircraft unit. If I don't need, you know, if I don't, if this is gonna be a shorter duration and maybe I'm not gonna need food, I'm not gonna have, you know, a food unit. You, 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 the, the form of that organization is going to be, is going, is going to follow the functions that need to be delivered, All right? So, it also brings with it a, a, a certain flexibility, right? Any position can be filled without necessarily filling all of the positions above it, right? Any of, you can fill a certain position and be like, okay, we're going to have the ESS is emergency social services is going to be very important for this. So we're going to put somebody in, you know, overseeing the emergency social services side of things. Um, but it doesn't mean that we necessarily need to also have, you know, uh, people, every single form above them also filled out. Right, so we may still not even have an operations chief. It might just be ESS reporting straight up to the incident commander, depending on the situation. Right, but each element has to have a person in charge. If you create a position, you have to have somebody in charge of that position. Right, so like I said, functions will determine the required organization. Right, so we can look at it and we can break it down this way. We have a small incident organization, you might have a commander and a couple of single resources under that commander. As soon as we start looking into the large incident organizations, you're going to have a command. Uh, you're going to have this, the, the various sections, the operations section, the finance section. They're going to be broken down further into branches or divisions and groups and single resources, right? So we add those layers as they are needed, right? Any elements that we no longer need should be deactivated, right? And we, uh, with the organization can expand or consolidate as required. All right, the incident commander will decide on whether to expand or contract the incident command system based on three major incident priorities, life safety, incident stability, and property conservation. These are very important, all right? Understanding that these are our priorities, life safety, responders, everybody else, 
incident stabilization, let's stop it from getting any worse, and then property conservation. That's, you know, again, we're looking at helping, uh, making sure that we uh, protect the property as we can. And that is a hierarchical order, right? In order of priority. Uh, right, there's always an incident commander. Uh, and the other uh, management element, uh, elements will develop from the top down as needed, right? So here we have the incident commander. Um, basically, we're going to, with, with the incident commander, you know, maybe do we need an operations, uh, do we need something in operation? Great, we're going to put an operations section chief in. We're going to put a, a planning chief, a logistics chief, a finance chief in, right? Now, this uh, operation section is a little different in that it develops from the bottom up, right? Uh, for a small incident, we may end up having, uh, you know, a situation where we have a couple of single resources uh, that are now re reporting to the operations chief, right? Um, so again, this, uh, the operation section is going to develop uh, depending on the type of the incident, the agencies involved, uh, what our objectives and strategies are, and, um, and basically, what can we do with the resources that we have? So this is really a, the most common organizational structure in ICS. So we'll briefly talk about a few of these things, right? Divisions. Um, there, so if we start breaking down operations into divisions, we're talking about a geographical assignment, okay? So they work in a designed area or location. So here we have division A, division B, and different resources with them, right? So let's, can, let's say it's a structure fire, a major structure fire on a, major, on a large scale property or commercial uh, property. We might have an operations section chief. Uh, division A would be responsible for alpha side. Division B might be Bravo. We might have a division, uh, a Charlie division and a Delta division as well that would be responsible for a geographical area, right? So <laughs> that's important to understand about that, right? It might be based on building floors. Uh, in, in large scale, you might see it in, uh, in high rises and things like that. You're gonna have, you know, the, like the, the 42nd floor division or whatever. Uh, so yeah, you can divide it like that. However you're dividing it, in a, if it's in a geographical way, that's called a division. Now groups uh, is a functional assignment. Right, so taking the house uh, and basically they they work wherever they're needed. So it's, they're not uh, confined by geography. This is something you're probably more common and and more used to seeing in our system in terms of having you know groups uh, created, like an attack. Uh, and for us, we call them teams, right? The attack team, the search team. These are idea. These can be considered groups as well, right? Which may have one person overseeing it. Uh, and in this case, they've got a medical group, a search group. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, other resources below that, right? So uh, groups where ne will work wherever they're needed, can work across all the divisions, and uh, basically groups uh, are going to be headed as well by a supervisor. So divisions and groups function on the same operation level and, uh, and may be used together on an incident, right? So you may have uh, you know, you might have an alpha and a bravo di uh, division, but then you also set up a medical group. They're all on the same level. So after the chief, you're looking at groups and divisions as being the next level in the operations section, right? One does not supervise the other. Um, and basically, the efforts need to be coordinated when they're working in the same geographical area. Uh, division and group supervisors do not have support personnel like, a, a, like a, a deputy or assistant, and they will report directly to the incident commander uh, uh, unless the operations section chief uh, has been established or a branch director, right? So if there is no operations section chief, you may end up having a medical group going straight to the incident commander. But they will, again, like unity of command, like we talked about, they will have one supervisor and know and they need to know who that is so i kind of said the word branch just a second ago we'll talk a little bit about that branch level operations are going to be established for uh, again for span of control we start getting a bigger incident looks like i lost somebody um so for span of control so the need for a uh, functional branch structure um, maybe we have a multi-jurisdictional incident uh, again may have separate branch for each jurisdiction so 
if we, we talk about geographic branches, uh, so the operation, so we've gotten, you know, maybe we have an A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we start getting to, you know, nine letters in the alphabet with divisions. Well, now we want to start breaking it up into branches for, you know, to keep that span of control uh, at an appropriate level for that, you know, for everybody above in the system. So the operation section chief is not having to oversee nine and getting outside of that three to seven range that we talked about, right? So now we're going to start breaking into branch. Branch levels are headed by directors and they may have one or more deputies. So again, remember that branch director, director, right? Incident commander, command staff, we have officers, the information officer, safety officer, for, uh, for, for the general staff, the operations, planning, logistics, finance, we have chiefs, right? So operations section chief. And for branches, we have directors. So you'll have branch one director, branch two director, however you are putting, uh, uh, however you are determining those branches, all right? Branches may, uh, and so when we talk about functional branches, again, we might have a medical branch, a search branch, a security branch with multiple search teams under them, multiple med medical teams with different responsibilities that will manage various operational functions. All right, special operations are activated at the branch level, right? So we may have the operations section chief. He, they, they've set up a air operations branch director, uh, maybe a marine operations is also required. And then every, then you'll start having the different uh, tactical, uh, tactical groups, um, possibly, you know, the task force strike group uh, and, and strike teams underneath them as well. Right. Uh, it's often convenient to you to use this kind of setup for organizations that have pre-established organizational structures. Um, the branch director will report directly to the IC. Okay. So when we uh, basically resources set up uh, at a, maybe that are waiting to be assigned, we might, and if we have a number of them, we're we're going to want to set up what's called staging. And uh, I, I'll talk a little, I may end up doing a, <clears throat> another talk on, uh, on staging officer uh, in, a, in a week or two. Um, but staging, uh, the staging area will normally have a manager who will report uh, to the operations chief. And uh, maybe basically the staging area might end up, it might need to be relocated if necessary. Um, branches may have separate staging areas, like the medical may have an ambulance staging area and your, your search team may have a different staging area for fire apparatus, uh, but they will be under the operations chief as well. Um, <clears throat> so they're established whenever they're necessary. And what's again, that it's an area to temporary, lo temporarily locate resources that are awaiting assignment. So they haven't been assigned yet, awaiting assignment, we need a place to put them, let's put them in the staging area. And again, that's, that's for us, we call that level two staging. Level one staging would be the staging that is right at the site level uh, and, and has been assigned. Level two staging is what we're talking about here and having a separate area for uncommitted resources. All right, let's talk about our 10th principle, personnel accountability. So there are forms uh, available. ICS Form 211 is a check-in form um, and uh, it's a way of maintaining accountability, making sure all of our people are accounted for. In the fire service, we're very used to this. Keeping accountability at a fire scene at an emergency incident is very important. We need to make sure we can account for everybody there and everyone goes home safe, right? When we lose, start losing track of personnel, that's when things can start going sideways. Um, check-in is gonna be mandatory for all personnel. If you may find the check-in, depending on the size of this, the incident, uh, might be at the incident command post. Uh, larger incidents, you might be going to a staging area or a base camp, uh, or a base or camp, or a, a heli base. Um, there might be division or group supervisors around that you need to check in with. Um, and again, you only have one, like with the unity, we only want to have one supervisor giving directions. Um, and uh, there may be involved as well what's called a resource status unit. So we want to have that unity of command. Um, and we want to have some kind of, uh, we might have a resource status unit that maintains the status of all of our assigned resources. Are they in service? Are they assigned? Are they available? Are they out of service, right? And where are they at and when can we get them? So with personnel uh, accountability, uh, you might have division or group assignment lists, there might be unit logs. So with the division, it, what that identifies is active resources in the operations section. Um, the unit logs identify personnel assigned to the ICS organizational elements. So what's going, you know, who's in the operations section in the EOC. 
All right, the 11th principle we'll talk about, common terminology, all right? So pre-designated and appropriate terms uh, basically need to be applied to our org uh, organizational functions and elements, uh, position titles. We wanna make sure we're all talking the same language, uh, facilities and our resources, right? So pre-designated and consistent uh, terminology is very important uh, across all agencies involved in the response. Uh, if we're talking different languages and if, you know, if writ means something different to an RCMP officer than it does to a firefighter, maybe that's a term we don't want to be using. Uh, but what ICS has helps us do is, is really help uh, put those common terminologies in. We have, you know, the incident commander. We all know what that is going to be, the safety officers, and we have those common terminologies uh, when we start talking about task force, strike teams, and all that as well. Um, Use of common terminology also helps to increase our efficiency and reduce confusion. Um, and uh, incidents are going to be specifically named, right? For example, when we go to a call, you might end up having, uh, you know, the, the Trans-Canada Highway Command or, or uh, you know, Squilax Anglemont Command, um, or you may name it after your fire department. It might end up being, you know, Shoe Swap Command or Scotch Creek Command in those two cases I gave there. So you're able, you know, so again, we want to name the command and we want to be, and, uh, and uh, make sure everybody is calling it by the same name. So with those, so I talked about some of the systems of ICS and we use a common terminology, for example, division, branch, unit, we're all talking the same language. By taking this course, you're now getting that education into that language so that when you hear these terms, you're going to understand what's being talked about. Things like position titles, officer, director, leader, etc. right? As we work together, we start to get these, uh, you understand these common terminologies. Um, our facilities need common terminology. The, an incident command post is a com is common terminology. A staging area, we know what we're talking about with that. If I say staging area to you or a different uh, agency, they should all know what that is. Um, resources, like I mentioned, task force, strike teams, etc. right? So we want to use common terms for all personnel and equipment resources as well. And we want to use clear text on the radio. Many of you have probably taken our communications training already. And uh, again, we, we use clear text. We don't use 10 codes. We don't use other types of, uh, of jargon on the radio. We use very clear text so that everybody understands what's going on. So here's some, here's some, uh, here's some uh, common terminology that is important for us to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, the primary position would be uh, to be an incident command, the title would be the incident commander, and their support would be a deputy, right? With the command staff, they're known as officers and they have assistants. Uh, with the sections, so operations section, uh, the planning section, logistics, finance, they have a chief and they also have a, a deputy that, that, would, uh, that is their support. Uh, on the branch level, uh, branch uh, and uh, branch level, you have a director and a deputy uh, for divisions and groups. You have a supervisor and no support. Uh, so again, these uh, these are important. Uh, page thirty five, you can see all of this in your student handout as well. So uh, yeah, keep those in mind. Uh, so that uh, and uh, yeah, some of this might uh, appear on the celebration of learning too. Uh, now we're starting to get into the uh, ICS organizational structure and uh, just kind of see what those, that common, uh, where that comes in, right? So we've got the incident commander at the top and their managerial level, they are commanders, right? We have section chiefs on the level below that. We have directors at the branch level. We have supervisors at the division and group level. And we have the leader uh, at the single resources task force strike team. So again, the team leaders like we would be used to seeing at our, uh, at our smaller incidents, right? Uh, another area where common terminology is important is in the ICS incident facilities, okay? So on maps, you'll see um, it, there's a very specific way that things need to be, you know, put on maps. And here are some of the, the things you may find on a map, and this is what you're, and this is what they mean. If we all, it doesn't matter who's looking at it, um, you should understand, you know, that if you see an S with a circle around it, that's the staging area, and it'll have a name beside it. It might, you know, it might be called the Squilax staging area, or, you know, or the, uh, whatever, Ross Creek staging area, wherever you are. Let's go through a, a bit of that, all right? So the incident command post, this can be the location of the incident commander. You're only gonna have one incident command uh, post per incident or event. And 
an incident command post is required at every incident or event. Uh, it may be relocated or expanded as required. Normally it's going to be outside of any kind of potentially hazardous zone. Um, it may be mobile at first and, uh, and eventually have, you know, eventually find a spot for it. Um, uh, it'll be designated by the name of the incident and what's going on. Uh, so again, it might end up being, you know, the Scotch Creek command if that's, if, if it's happening in a certain jurisdictional area. Um, it'll have, it'll be high, like highly visible. We want to, we want people to know where the incident command post is and it's, it may be a check-in point uh, for crews for accountability. Sean? Yes. We still have uh, possibilities of like a secondary command post, right? Like say on a strip mall or uh, apartment buildings, you can't get to the backside as easy. So you might set up on the backside or not. If you're setting up a command post for a specific incident, Darcy, you're going to want to have one, right? Um, as I mean, if you have another uh, incident that happens, uh, you may end up having another command post established somewhere else. But usually, they'll then you're, you're now looking at having an emergency operations center activated that will help with the two different incidents that are going on. Now we're getting into an expansion. But no, for each event, we're looking at one incident command post. We don't want to have multiple ones because uh, you don't want to be going around trying to say, well, where the heck's the incident commander at? Where's the command staff at? There should be one spot where we can find them at the incident. All right. Staging areas. Uh, so with the staging areas, basically uh, maybe a, uh, a temporary location at the incident, but what we're looking at here, these are location, uh, locations to place available resources. Uh, you might have several staging areas depending on the uh, size of the event. Um, the staging manager will report to the incident commander or possibly the operations section chief if one has been assigned. Uh, resources uh, need to be available at the staging area on a three minute notice, okay? And it may, you may end up relocating, right? You might be in a hazardous area and you need to relocate uh, away from the hazard. Uh, it's gonna need to be large enough to accommodate all the resources that are there, clearly marked. Um, at times, we'll, you know, a lot of times we'll see uh, security controls in place as well. These, uh, you know, the resources at these staging areas are expensive and uh, we, we don't just want anybody wandering into a staging area and, you know, saying, oh, look, nice fire truck, going for a little bit of a joyride. So you might have security there. Uh, staging area might also be another one of the check-in points, just like the incident command post. If you see a B with a circle, you might find what you're uh, on a map, what you're looking at there is a base. So what a base is, is it's a location for primary service and support activities. Uh, typically you only have one per incident and not always going to be required, right? Uh, logistics might be located uh, sort of at, at uh, the base, uh, any out of service equipment and personnel uh, that, support, that are there to support the operations might be at the base. Um, again, it's going to be designated by the incident, uh, by the incident name. Uh, so again, call it Scotch Creek Base or however you want to call it. Um, managed by uh, the logistics facilities unit. They're the ones who are going to, so the base manager is going to come from that logistics section. And a base can be another area for check-in for, for accountability. A C with a circle around it, that's camps, all right? So again, maybe temporary locations uh, might have to move depending on, you know, re the realities of the scene. Um, they camps, what they're there for is to help service incident personnel, give them sleeping areas, food, water, sanitary services, things like that. Um, maybe one or more, depending on how big the incident is. You'll have a camp manager. Um, again, they're through uh, the facilities unit of logistics will usually be the camp manager. Uh, and it'll be designated by a geographic name, right? And again, another check-in location possibility. So knowing where you're going when you're heading out there is important because there are a lot of different possibilities for check-in locations. Probably should have clicked that earlier. All right, the H with the circle around it is a heli base, right? So with these, we want to make sure they're close to the incident site. Uh, the idea is that you're, you know, with a, you need a helicopter to come in, you want it to be close enough that it's going to be effective and doesn't use a lot of burn, a lot of gas and fuel on its way, uh, on its way to the incident scene, right? Um, it'll be designated by the incident name. Um, so depending on where you're at, uh, maybe more than one per incident. Uh, it could be, it could have a number as well. Let's say we have, you know, Scotch Creek Heli, you know, uh, Heli Base 1, Scotch Creek Heli Base 2, depending on how big of a fire we're dealing with there or how big of an incident we're dealing there. 
Uh, Helibase will have a manager um, base and uh, that they will be uh, reporting to the error support group supervisor, uh, the error ops branch, uh, which is uh, often out of uh, operations, and another potential check-in location. A heli spot. Um, and basically these are smaller areas, maybe not as a, typically not as big as a heli base, uh, and they'll have their manager and they're going to, the, the managers of a heli spot would report to the, the heli base manager. So there might be multiple spots uh, and all reporting to the one base manager. Another place that could be a check-in location. So these are temporary landing location for uh, loading and offloading um, large incidents. You could find several of these around. All right, now we get to number 12 of our ICS principles, and that is integrated communications. So basically, uh, with integrated communication, we want to have a common communications plan that, that works for the whole incident. Uh, we're going to want to have standard operating procedures established uh, and, and, and understood and used. Uh, we're going to use clear text when we are talking, so it's uh, not 10 codes, not any kind of other code. We're using clear text. We want to use common frequencies, uh, and uh, if we basically everyone has a, the avail is a, has those frequencies available and, uh, and is able to get onto them. Uh, and we're going to be using that common terminology that we talked about, uh, very important in communications. So, you know, what, when we're looking at what kind of hardware, you know, uh, radios, repeaters, base stations, mobile units, um, you know, what frequencies are going to be used by whom? Um, what, is the pro what is the process for transferring information um, that, you know, we're going to be using radios, uh, fax machine, I don't know, telephone? Um, so, and then what are the procedures, like who does uh, the communicating and when is it appropriate to be communicating? So uh, with integrated communications, uh, basically we can look and say, you know, we've got a command net, tactical net, support nets. The command net, um, it links supervisory personnel, uh, personnel to the incident commander uh, and the incident commander to the groups or divisions. Um, the tactical net, um, maybe various methods, uh, might be by the agency, area, function, etc. Um, the support net, uh, it might be logistic traffic and resource statuses. Um, ground to air coordinates activities. Air to air also coordinates the activities of, 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 uh, of, of our aircraft. And we have completed this lesson on incident in, on level 100 ICS. Somehow I got through it in an hour and a half. Are there any questions? When you when you're thinking about, you don't want to wait until you have eight people under your command to start delegating. Do you, do you like? Would it not be? Because like, that's really close to going to that point where you have too many people under your command, right? Like, would you normally, like, what, what would you do in that situation? You know, it's going to depend on the, you know, what if it is difficult here, Dylan. And, uh, the, you know, once you think you're going to, you're going to have a, a system or you're going to need more resources and have a greater span of control coming at you, that's the time to start breaking it down, right? Um, I might, you know, I'm not going to wait and have seven and be like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oh, number eight showed up. Now I'm going to need to do, do something about it, right? Um, oftentimes I'm going to, you try to be proactive where you can. Um, but really the reality is it's going to depend on the, rea on, on what, uh, on what you're dealing with in that situation. Thanks for watching. This uh, video was brought to you by our team at the Columbia Shootswap Regional District. Follow the link below to continue on to the celebration of learning. Good luck.